35 years chasing the world's greatest Jews of the moment. Thanks. Uh, I uh, started uh, making this talk about one thing and then it switched to another and uh, in a retrospective uh, uh, look back, I realized that I'd actually been fairly close uh, to a bunch of fairly interesting and arguably uh, the world's greatest anomalies. Um, I might have to go, the, 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 other, the reason it's ramblings is as I recalled my times at those particular anomalies that were sort of some sidebar stories that happened and I just decided that I'll, I'll tell you some of those stories as we go along. Uh, one of the points that's come up a bunch of times is the, the topic of uh, whether we have enough data or whether we're doing enough with it and that sort of thing. And this is back uh, back in the uh, mid to early 80s and it's just a typical um, uh, exploration crew, really. And what's of note is that, that you know there's a, there's a couple geophysicists. I want to be a starting geophysicist and the old guy, uh, prospector, geologist, uh, the project geologist, the regional boss guy. And uh, okay. th this, this um, uh, slide actually came up because I was looking for a picture of this guy, Greg Crow, who uh, will come up later in the, in the talk. Uh, I'll start the venture, this part of the venture up here in the Northwest Territories, where I was involved with uh, Digim surveys, flying uh, work for Jerry Roth up at the north end of Contuero Lake. Uh, so this is uh, uh, northern Canada, that's Contuero Lake. And um, BHP had, had uh, the, 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 this is all about the diamond discoveries up in the, up in the territories, and uh, Chuck Fipke had found uh, a trail that led to this Lake Point Lake, and uh, BHP had gotten involved with Hugo Dummett and some other uh, geophysicists that one, oh, there he is over there, it's in the background, and uh, these guys had schemed to, uh, you know, divert my activity, which was trying to get home, and uh, we were going to go and have to fly one or two flights over Point Lake. Uh, and again, no GPS at the time, so it's, you know, draw a circle on the map and send the helicopter down to, uh, to uh, Point Lake. And so we managed to fly the lines, and unfortunately in my old uh, dusty boxes, I couldn't find uh, the, uh, the original date. I used to uh, keep copies of it, apparently Ken has it. And it was fairly significant uh, 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 data, but what was going on at the time uh, once they got the data, and uh, there was a big powwow meeting confirming that you know there's a significant uh, uh, um, conductive anomaly within the lake that isn't um, loon, uh, loon shit. Um, there was the plans were to carry on uh, 20,000 line uh, kilometers of geophysics, and so I just made it home, and then I got set back up uh, to. Uh, uh, Point Lake, where I met a couple of interesting people. Um, Ray Ashley, Peter Diorio was in and out, and, and uh, away we went. Uh, what was interesting is we had stashed all the fuel drums uh, in the fall time, and it basically took almost two to three hours for two drums of fuel by the time I got out there. I was sort of the land crew, geophysicist guy, while the operator was flying the survey. And uh, we'd get these, uh, these uh, barrels out. The other thing that was interesting was um, they were very secretive. They didn't want anybody else around to see what the anomaly was. And so uh, Ray had set up a, a big loop, uh, a couple loops around the lake and, and nearby and had a, uh, I believe it was like a proton generator uh, causing noise and such uh, to distort the signals of, of anybody else because there's a lot of rumors and people were coming up north to uh, to uh, get these, uh, try and get the signature, because if they could get the signature, then of course they could say, hey, I can fly the airborne service for you too. Um, and then one morning, so the, the, no, the camp was often noisy, so one morning I went out, outside to, uh, you know, take a look around or whatever, and I was sitting there and I, it was just a beautiful morning, it was really quiet, and I was sitting there and I looked and off in the distance I could see this this plane coming, which was at the time our sister company, uh, Geo um, Terex, uh, and uh, all I remember doing, I yelled out just like that guy on Fantasy Island, the plane, the plane! <laughs> Ray came running out of the, 
out of the uh, the shed trying to get the generator started. Oh, there wasn't any gas. At, at that time, I, I said, wow, this is great. You know, I, I'm going to try to get a picture. So I ran back inside, grabbed my camera, and got a picture of the plane doing a low and over over the lake. Um, later on, and, the, and then subsequently, uh, the, the sensors and the, uh, uh, the another competitor came by that morning too. <laughs> I got a call later in the day by the president of the company going, hey Rob, thanks a lot. And I was going, what do you mean, thanks a lot? He goes, well, we figured you must have turned off the generator, right? <laughs> but that wasn't the case. <laughs> so the, uh, all that snow turned into an igloo and uh, there's some old uh, colleagues from the north. Uh, this is hot off the, hot off the press uh, uh, mag map at the time uh, as, as the uh, project came together. Um, which was going to make me rich, and that's a whole other story, but uh, uh, it didn't work out that way. Uh, I found this on the uh, internet uh, recently, and, and that's another qualifier. And on all the data samples that I'm showing, they're sort of from the Wayback Machine, if you will. Uh, but I found this on the uh, internet, showing where all the where all the pipes are with re re relationship to the mag and such. It was it was pretty pretty exciting times. These were some of the anomalies uh, from some of the other uh, other um, uh, pipes on the on the property. There was just a, they were just popping up all over the place. And I was you know I got to be on the cover of a couple of uh, of um, uh, annual reports and in magazines. It was uh, you know pretty heady times for uh, the geophysicist. Later, Fugro took over CGG and tried to claim uh, uh, a little bit of. Uh, um, relationship to the discovery, but I uh, argue that uh, it should uh, it should be me. <laughs> so moving on to the next one, uh, we we uh, we next secured a project down in uh, Boise's Bay, which was really fun, and um, uh, we landed. And uh, before we actually flew the uh, survey, the, the we were in a trailer park uh, uh, type accommodations and. A geophysicist from uh, Colorado came out, Terry Krebs. He was ranting and raving about the strangway curves because the geologists were using uh, uh, Max Mint to target uh, the uh, the anomaly. That's what the Verbiskis had done, and uh, they 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 had a miss, and another. They turned the drill around and had another miss. They were panicked. Uh, the, the, the diamond fields had now become involved. The share price had already gone up to about twenty bucks. But uh, now they had two significant misses in a row. And uh, Krebs, we were all in a little room, tiny room, Krebs said, you know, you gotta trust the strangway curves. I think we should drill a vertical hole here. And uh, so they put it on vertical and, and uh, Terry became uh, famous because the uh, deposit kept going and uh, away we went. But the, uh, the real, the side, side, the, the, the side story about this was, during this period where we collected and we're making these maps and it was all super exciting and such. So much so that the, you know, the company let me spend on helicopter time flying around, taking movies and videos of, of, um, of our system flying. But uh, I convinced our, our office that we needed to have a little give back to the community. And I uh, asked for some money to buy tickets to the Susan Glue Clark, the First Nation lady from the north, was coming down to Maine to uh, to um, uh, give a concert. And I think I got 40 or 50 tickets, and I went around like Santa Claus, handing them out to everybody and taking all the credit for being like the superstar. And finally, it came up to the day of the concert, and uh, you know, I'm sort of the last one walking up to the school. And as I'm getting close to the school, you know, everybody's inside except for this old lady and this old man, and um, an, an Inuit, and uh, and a little 14-year-old girl who I sort of recognized. And as I was sort of walking up and trying to make my way to the door, I heard, uh, "Mr. Rob, Mr. Rob," and uh, I said, "Yes." And uh, she said, uh, "Do you have a ticket for me?" And I said, "No," and ran in the school. <laughs> I handed off the last ticket and it was like, oh. So in, she went into the school and I was on the outside. Finally, I went and knocked on the door. Unfortunately, the, the lady ho uh, doing the door uh, tickets was the hotel owner who I was a pretty good friend with. She let me go in and uh, the first song um, uh, was Amazing Grace by uh, Susan Blue Park. 
Anyhow, so then I, um, uh, for a variety of reasons, I decided to get back into the ground business and started working with uh, Keith Morrison at Quantech. I was supposed to manage the Canadian office. It was the week of Brayex that I joined. There was no work. Uh, he grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and said, you know what you have to do? You have to get out there and sell some geophysics. <laughs> and so that was my first slap in the head about, okay, well, what does that mean? How do you do that? And fortunately, uh, Keith had, uh, had some interesting plans. We got involved with uh, MIM over in Australia and started operating their MIMDAS system for them. And uh, we opened a, an Australian office and Keith went over to visit one time and met uh, in the doghouse, uh, John Kingman, who was sort of the brain trust behind uh, the MIMDAS system, and he convinced him to uh, come back to Canada and make next generation uh, MIMDAS, which was uh, the Titan system. And uh, for those of you who don't know it, it's a distributed, that was the big thing that it was a distributed uh, array, which was uh, move the computers along the line. We can now make the line sort of infinitely length and get uh, really good quality data. We typically would go 2,400 meters long and we would get, we started getting, uh, and, and the computers were multi-functioning so we could do IP in the daytime and, and turn it into an MT survey at night. We cheated a little bit on the MT, we only used one set of coils, but uh, effectively we were getting 100 meter MT data down to roughly around 1,500 meters, two kilometers, and then DC and IP. I wasn't going to dwell on that, I just wanted to give you the background. So now we had this new technology, what were we going to do with it? And uh, the industry, as, as uh, Richard pointed out, uh, very slow to adapt. Like, uh, you know, TDM Borhol took about 15 years to get going, and uh, the first people I approached with Titan, I said, uh, uh, well, you know, you can go deeper, and uh, they would say, well, we don't want to go deep. If we can't find it in the top 100 meters, we don't care about it. And other people would say, well, have you found anything with it yet? Uh, and I said, well, uh, no, we just, we just got it. And so there were so many reasons, and the price was higher. So it was very difficult to get any work with this system uh, right away. And uh, it had cost a lot to build. We had a couple major mining companies supporting us on one, on one front, Barrick and and Miranda, but 9-11 uh, happened and Miranda slashed all their budgets and we were sort of out in the cold. Fortunately, I, I found a um, uh, government grant in Ontario that gave us uh, the ability to demonstrate the technology. And this was critical timing, like it was very critical timing we, we got that grant. And I, I went around and I tried to find four sort of interesting case studies. One, I picked a, uh, um, a gold mine uh, up at Gold Corp. We wanted to demonstrate the GOCAD technology, physical rock properties, and constrained inversions. Uh, we did Kid Creek, a mine site survey. And we also did FNX mining. And then I picked a junior, mostly because the guy was sort of a friend of mine, uh, but also he said he could pony up his share of the money in that. And so we did the survey, and we got the giant anom anomaly. It was like a... Just a, an amazing anomaly, and it it helped us cause some buzz, and, and not necessarily over promoting, but uh, the uh, the financiers were behind it. They actually paid for a trip uh, for everybody to go to uh, Europe to uh, raise money. Um, uh, we got articles in the paper and that, and they actually raised three million dollars. And I told uh, Ian, which is one of those guys in the picture, I said, "Don't drill it." just let the next guys drill it, you know? And uh, he said, well, no, no, the investors want me to drill it now, because it had been quite some time before they got the money to be able to drill it. And I, and I said, well, why, Rob? You know, uh, uh, you know, what if it's Kid Creek? And I said, you know, the chances of it being Kid Creek are really, really small. In fact, I would say that it might be a fault that goes all the way to Hudson's Bay and maybe it's salt water coming up. That would it, that's what it could be, right? Anyhow, uh, they finally drilled it, and uh, arguably it was a technical success, but uh, down at about 800 meters, they hit a big slab of graphite. And then they drilled through that slab, still hoping that there was something in, in the abyss, and hit a meter of, or a foot, actually, of calcopyrite down at uh, 1,200 meters, which was probably totally unrelated to the, to the model. But it was early days in our inversion modeling and that sort of thing, and, 
and uh, people weren't too disgruntled by it. This was sort of the first time people were getting into deep end tea. Then the next challenge was trying to find a known deposit, a porphyry deposit that I could uh, talk about. And I went to uh, Rio Tinto and they completed to do a demonstration survey over resolution. And nobody wanted to have any part of that or me. And uh, time went by and I was, you know, pondering, pondering and I was out at the Saskatchewan show and it was a, a morning afternoon. I took off the last two uh, presentations. I went to Woolworths because there was a big sale sign there, and there was a there was a big box of old-fashioned ski sweaters. And I, I got by the box of ski sweaters and I was like looking at them, you know, trying to find just the perfect color and size. And I noticed there was another guy on the other side of the box doing the same thing. Like he was like equally enthusiastic about these sweaters. They were marked down from like 90 bucks to 10 bucks or something. Anyhow, we were in the checkout line buying our sweaters, looking at the tags, and mine was Quantec, and he goes, oh, what's Quantec? You and I go, yeah, that's right, you probably don't know because you guys never use us. And he was this, the new guy at, at Rio Tinto. And so I asked, uh, I asked his name was uh, Andrew Cole, I asked him if uh, he'd be interested in uh, you know, funding a short, small demonstration survey. And, and so we got the demonstration survey, got some really good results, did some constrained inversions, <coughs> And then Andrew Cole disappeared. He went into the financial part of, of uh, Rio Tinto. And the new guy, whom I can't quite remember now, was, you know, he was the new guy and he didn't know the history or anything, so he didn't want to give me the data. And so, you know, it was three or four years later pestering these guys where finally, I think it was Theo Urbanus might have said, okay, enough, Rob, you can have it. And I got one slide which was this, uh, which shows the uh, constrained inversion over uh, resolution some time ago. I won't dwell on things here because uh, I've got a whole bunch of other rants and raves. But what, what was neat about this was I, used, uh, I, I, was, had, I was having to make some marketing material about this, and, and Ken Witherly had this data set which from, from that he was using for some other purpose, but it showed that in the early 50s with the advent of airborne and new technology had a rash of discoveries. And then this little piece here actually might have come from one of Richard's uh, PowerPoints or whatever, but it was like a, a crop of decreasing copper discoveries in and around the 2000s. And so uh, with my new uh, data that says that I can actually image down this deep and see, you know, the, the resolution had been discovered here, but I could at least see it, you know, this was the potential. And so I used this fairly effectively for some time, just trying to get people interested in, in looking deeper. And, and I, I think that, um, uh, well, it comes up a little bit later, but part of the reason that it's not uh, pervasive everywhere is there's just not enough geophysicists that are willing to, you know, um, uh, promote ourselves and our technologies and what we can do. <clears throat> so then what I was reading in the news was uh, they had made this huge discovery over in Mongolia and I think one of the key discoverers in the audience and after he had, uh, uh, Charlie uh, Forrester was, uh, uh, I'd see them at shows and I'd say, hey, you know, use, try and use our technology and such. And they were already well underway, so they had had their own technology and, and were drilling and had, had made all this. But I noticed there was a junior miner had staked all the ground north of what you told me. And uh, I went on the internet, I guess there was internet then, right? and uh, uh, found Andre Gold. President was none other than my old boss, uh, Greg Crow. So it was an easy call to call in and say, hey, Greg. You know what you should do? You should do Titan. It's like the latest and greatest deep IP. We can probably see that deep. And his, what he said to me was, goes, no, I don't want to do Titan. I want to do exactly what they're doing. And I said, well, what are they doing? And he goes, I don't know. You find out, and we'll go from there. And so I called uh, a guy named Grant Hendrickson. Yeah. I called him up and I asked him, I said, what the heck are you doing? And uh, anyhow, so th this is the, just this is the property boundary here. This is sort of what they had been uh, doing at the time. I don't know if they were that far down, but th this was Greg's property over here. And 
Anyhow, the plan was, uh, I had a battle with Greg, like it went on and on and on, and finally I said, okay, how about this, we'll take our technology over there, oh sorry, I, the, 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 the little bit was I did talk to Grant and found out that he was doing what effectively was a, 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 a shrinking Slumbers A survey, which we had talked real about. Real section IP. Which we had talked about real section IP, although Grant didn't call it that at the time, and so, um, we had stopped doing real section. Of course, we were we were pontificating about Titan, and um, anyhow, so I said to Greg, "Okay, what we'll do is we'll go and set up Titan in real section configuration. We'll set it up in Titan configuration. We'll do three lines right at the boundary, and the best anomaly wins." Right was basically what we said. And beforehand, we actually. Uh, Jean Legault was my modeling guy, but we modeled up, uh, you know, some basics from what we understood about what could possibly be there, and we demonstrated that, yeah, we should be able to see this with a, a big uh, five-kilometer uh, array down at a thousand meters. And so we did all kinds of, this is part of the Wayback Machine, you see our old green logo here, and, uh, and the old Titan uh, logo back in the day. But uh, anyhow, so we did modeling for real section, we did modeling for uh, pole dipole to see which was going to be uh, better, and still trying to convince them not to do the real section, because we just really didn't want to do that. It was going to take, I don't know, more people or more time or something. Anyhow, these were the results of the real section, and then uh, we had collected there, and, and there's obviously some deep uh, features in that, and again, I won't get into that, because I have to keep sort of rambling along, but... Um, <coughs> When we showed the pole dipole, Greg said, okay, I'll go with, I'll go with the Titan. Albeit the anomaly wasn't quite in the right spot due to all the uh, various things that, uh, that uh, Joel was uh, mentioning. Uh, what we did find out, though, was that if we backed off current off the ends of our, off of the ends of our uh, pole dipole array uh, and collected extra data, for, uh, that, that it actually enhanced what the, uh, what the uh, inverted uh, sections looked like, and, and we pretty well incorporate that into our surveys. Um, um, so we did two to three minutes. That's like going to be impossible. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, so what happened next was I went to uh, Chemis, and um, there's a whole really neat side story about this one, but the bottom line was I, I saw these guys and I read their press. They were drilling down 600 meters in this mountain range, and uh, I approached uh, the VPX at the time, whom I knew and had been uh, uh, for, for, from this other story, and uh, had said, uh, you know, you should really try try some of our stuff here. I think we can help you vector and uh, find, get to your, whatever you're after down below, which is sort of a porphyry type of uh, uh, system. And um, this actually involved uh, uh, to the point where we did significant, uh, Jean Legault again did this, but I asked him to, uh, uh, I basically said to, uh, the first guy, Chris Rockingham, said, you're going to have to talk to my guy, Carl Edmonds, out in BC. So I, I actually flew out there, presented the technology, tried to convince him to do it, and, and then finally I could see he was wavering, and I said, well, we could pretend to do the survey. And he was like, well, how's that? Well, we'll do some forward modeling. And so we built, we built these uh, fairly sophisticated geological models with a variety of resistivities, and plunked in a blank one and, and one with a porphyry system and a, and a cap on it. And we did all of this modeling for them, and all of this whole process took about a year of time to convince them to uh, do the survey. And um, you know, clearly, we could see this stuff way down here at uh, at uh, you know uh, deeper than 600 meters, so which was fairly significant. And we did the survey. There was the blob. They drew below the blob and made the discovery, a new discovery. And at the time. They commented that, you know, drilling the Titan anomalies, blah, 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 biggest section ever in 2007. And then in 2017, I noticed these guys all got the award for the best, uh, the best uh, geo, whatever, here we are, prospecting and mineral exploration, blah, blah, blah. I desperately was reading the thing for my name, or, <laughs> or Titan's name on behalf of my company, whatever. Didn't see it at all. And I just sort of like, I'm really like, ah. Oh. 
And I approached him on, I said, hey, come on, Chris, like you're way down at like 700 meters. Uh, yeah, well, you know, the deposit wasn't that blob. The deposit was just right below that blob. And I go, well, uh, how about we helped you vector? Oh, I suppose you could say that. Anyhow, I'm, I'm still just a little bitter about that because it's hard to try and get your name attached to. Right? Um, and so this was from another presentation I gave, but I just wanted to go back to the fact of like, why did they forget about us? Someone else said, I think it was Ken at the beginning said that, uh, you know, the story changes over long periods of time. And, Guess who gets forgotten? It's always the geophysicist. Who are the fringe people on the outside of the exploration world? As you know, reflecting back on 35 years, I had done a few little uh, look rounds. I had asked a couple of clients, a major, an intermediate. Uh, you know, what are you spending on geophysics? And uh, you know, this is just stats from like three or four companies. But it's 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 in. It's not enough. It should be like 10%, and it should be probably mandated by the presidents of, of these big, fancy uh, companies out there. And that 10% is going to help us get more people, no more juniors into the field, whether they have to soil sample when they're not doing an inversion model and that sort of thing. So that's a little bit about the rant and the, and the raving. And, you know, this is a, uh, the... the, the the problem I see uh, about what's going on. Geophysics is often an afterthought. But I haven't given up. Finally, <laughs> we're going to see the world's greatest anomaly, okay? So this was another guy, um, Peter Holbeck, out at Copper Mountain, and I had read something about him, and I called him up. I said, listen, I've got some technology that looks like it could work in your environment. We could put like five lines here, probably cost you about $250,000. Wow, that's a lot of money. It was quite expensive, you know, I think it was $250,000. And, uh, but he said, you know what, it sounds like a plan, let's, let's do that. And so we did that and we got this, we got this huge anomaly under, under the pit, quite a ways under the pit actually. And uh, they had, had been planning to make a new pit here based on their drilling and they were planning to make another pit here. They ended up drilling uh, for three holes. Uh, they hit uh, 300, roughly 300 meters of 0.5 copper, changed the uh, design of the, of the pit. Um, and then um, I saw him at a trade show recently and he, I had that in an old binder or something, and he goes, you know, my guys won't take that off our booth. And I said, well, why is that? Like, uh, this happened like 10 years ago. And he said, uh, well, um, you know, the survey cost us 290000 in 2007. We, we saved 140000 on condemnation drill. We saved on ABA drilling about 100000 We saved on permitting, and we actually were able to go out in the market and raise $50 million, and that's priceless. And so, arguably, uh, that for me is a key and critical um, anomaly, the world's greatest anomaly, to help the geophysical industry uh, show how significant and important geophysics can be uh, in, in the sector. Um, and so if you look close at Horton Here's a Who, you know, there's a whole community down there just crying out, we're here, we're here, we're here. So that's... Uh, that's the point. It's not that we're not here. We're here. We just need more people doing it. Um, and, but what I can claim, <laughs> if I can't claim my name to one of those dumb anomalies, I can claim that I'm the world's fastest geophysicist. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I kind of went over, so yeah, there's both. Well, you did a planking survey over uh, Monterey's ground. Uh, when? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember you guys doing that. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, well, it would have been, it would have been uh, probably 2005 or four. Is that about right? <laughs> I can look, I, I don't, I, actually, you know what, it'll be on that, uh, it might be on the, uh, the title block of the, uh, of that uh, IP session.
But it was about it was about then. It was sort of right after they got the ground, I think, you know, they were sort of doing a bunch of stuff and Need about a minute or two to get uh, back on. Oh, you should have told me about it. Well, you can still take questions. Well, yeah. So, yeah. Like, Rob, you're talking about all the cloak and dagger of the of the early days at, at Lac de Gras. Oh, right. That, that Point Lake was a lake on the point, right? Because the real Point Lake is way up in the middle of the Northwest Territories. So oh, yeah, that was, sorry. So it that was those guys on the radio trying to make it sound like their their discovery was somewhere completely point different. Yeah. yeah, maybe that was it. <coughs> the wrong point. Then. The side story is, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not proud of this, but the anomaly from Point Lake, and uh, I knew I had to go back up there. I was going to be up there for the whole winter. For the most time, we were using SDX 11, so you couldn't really communicate that well. Before I left, I said, Andrew, who's my brother, I said, listen, <clears throat> let's take $1,000 and uh, you invest it in, you know, this company, if I ask for my snowshoes, this company, if I ask for my big woolly mitts, and this company, if I ask for my cross-country skis. And I had, like, because I knew all the different companies I was going to next, right? So after I had that, I was like, wow, I'm, like, in control of the world. <laughs> And so we got to the first company. I was going, wow, look at that. There's another one. It's like, okay. But I didn't have access to the radio. So we got to the, the third one. And I called. I got on the SBX 11. And, and uh, you know, they put me through the radio operator. Girl comes on. I said, I'd like to speak to my brother. Is he there? Well, he's busy. You know, there's a big loud party in the back. And I said, well, could you tell him that I need my cross-country skis, my big woolly mitts, and my extra big boots or whatever, right? And uh, then the rest of the winter happened, and I was like, oh, wow, look at $1,000. Look at, there was one that went from like 11 cents to 11 bucks or something like that, right? And uh, anyhow, I, I uh, got home, and I came bursting in the door. I said, Andrew, Andrew, what? We're rich. <laughs> he goes, "What are you talking about?" And I was like, uh, "I said, well, I called and I asked for the, you know, we said I asked for the this and the that." And, the, and uh, he goes, "Oh, you know, this girl came up to me at the at the party and said, you know, your brother says he wants his uh, his winter stuff sent up there." <laughs> the, the use of the time domain system it was actually a Cron. BHP owned one of those. But I remember a discussion Dummett and Fipke had in the San Francisco office about the strategy. And at one point, and these two, were, you know, they're fair, both were fairly odd in their own way, but serious most of the time. And there was discussions about could they actually shoot at aircraft? And was it forbidden? And I had to tell them no. I said open skies policy, except my, my knowledge in Newfoundland, uh, they couldn't uh, legally bind them from not flying over. Uh, Chuck mentioned at one time about surface-to-air missiles and <laughs> things like this, but it was like, I didn't really quite know how to, uh, to react to all of that. We're just, uh, we're just about ready to get Rick on board.